Dan Campbell, the new head coach of the Detroit Lions. His enthusiastic nature and aggressive statements have captivated hot take machines across America. This is his true test. He will either be one of the greatest coaches of this generation or douche bro Freddie Kitchens. I expect no alternatives for Campbell. Be working with a perpetually rebuilding team that is going through another official rebuild. Matt Stafford was released from prison early for good behavior, so Jared Goff and his one year of success will be serving as placeholder until they find the next great talent to waste. Knowing this team, I expect it'll happen sooner rather than later, but it's not like there were hopes here to begin with. Those were probably shot to shit when Megatron retired. When a franchise misses Jim Caldwell, you know things are dire. The NFC is pretty tight in a lot of aspects. A logical person would just sit back and let it all develop, but I'm an impulsive bastard. I need to make shitty predictions that backfire quickly. The NFC East will surprisingly not change hands again, and it will be Washington that pulls it out. The NFC North is still Packers territory, however. The NFC South, I hate to say it, but Brady and the Buccaneers have it on lockdown. The NFC West, though? That's tough, but I'll have to say San Francisco bounces back if they're healthy. For the wild cards, I'm rolling with Seattle, New Orleans, and the Rams. Once again, many teams can be considered for these three slots. With that being said, I should shut the hell up. It's time for some fucking football. Oh, this is ugly. The 49ers are mopping the floor against Detroit. They're not even trying to refresh the water they use. They'll soak the Lions in all of that grimy sludge and stagnating muck for all of us to see as a warning. The first victim will be a man named Jeff Okuda. Suffering third-degree burns not only on the football field, but with the excoriations of his position coach. To add to the shit Sunday, he left the game early with injury. This was a third overall pick, by the way. The first overall pick they acquired from LA didn't look much better, but it's the Lions and the Niners have a 41-17 lead at the two-minute warning. This shouldn't be much of an issue. So, is anyone gonna talk about how Detroit is coming back into this game? Can San Francisco stop lathering margarine all over their hands before plays? The Lions are pushing down the field to tie the game for fuck's sake! Oh, thank god they escaped with a win. Niners never ever do that again. If you do, I'll hunt you down. Capiche? I wanted chaos, goddammit. I wanted Green Bay to disappear in a Hadron collision. Would we really miss the Packers? I don't believe so. This week, they'll posture and lord over us all because they won. Yes, they look good in the second half. Aaron Rodgers was himself again, and Aaron Jones scored four touchdowns. Am I supposed to lavish praise for it or something? You beat Detroit. It's the bare minimum for any team with championship ambitions to do. Even for the celebration, that defense still looked porous as hell in the first half. Kevin King is still a Packer. Unfortunately for Green Bay, he did not disappear in a Hadron collision. Maybe in the future we can send their hopes and dreams into a black hole. Detroit Lions are holding a celebration for Calvin Johnson today. It's full of bitterness and resentment for wasting his career and denying him what he's owed, but that won't stop them from playing Baltimore. As much of a mess as they've been over the years, they're playing a competently sound game. They aren't doing much of anything on offense, but what the Lions needed to do is contain Lamar Jackson. And they're doing it well. Although Hollywood Brown may be doing more than enough of that with his... performance. It appears on this festive occasion, the Ravens chose to imitate their rival four hours away. They're playing down to their competition. And it's humiliating to see. Baltimore, this is against a team trying to trade away Jamie Collins. They should be burying them, yet the defense is being left to dry. Nothing like helping them rest by Lamar throwing a pick. Their offense was hot garbage in the first half, but with a field goal after a long drive, Detroit has the lead with the minute left. Here I come to save the day. High-end talent bailing out a team playing like shit. I'm experiencing deja vu. But even that can't save them here, right? Justin Tucker needs to make the league's longest field goal of 66 yards to do it. On its way. It bounces off the crossbar. And it's good. Oh my god. Oh my goodness. Justin fucking Tucker. Call it a hot take all you want, but this man is a first ballot Hall of Famer. Single-handedly saving Baltimore's terrible game to lead them to an undeserved win. Why do I say that? Look at the play beforehand. This is the lay of game. That field goal should have never happened. Detroit got screwed out of a win in the most Detroit way possible. There is only one true conclusion we can make. God hates the Lions. Bobby Lane was wrong. His 50 year curse was based on Mars's orbit. That's it, Justin Fields is being sent to die. 
Matt Nagy is throwing him out again against Detroit to win. So you mean to tell me that the Bears emphasize the rushing game in team defense? They didn't force Fields to play over his head this week. Why Virginia McCaskey's undead corpse? It's like they should have been doing last week! It does come with the asterisk of being against the Lions, who personify how shit the Fords are at running a team. Red zone opportunities. Repeated red zone opportunities. You're supposed to score points on those? What's well, a good drought for sheer ineptitude over there? Like four? So they don't have to give the ball back to the Bears because they're trying to be nice. That's shocking. About as much as the fans still wanting Matt Nagy dead. I don't blame them with David Montgomery dying from overuse as a result. Detroit ever find peace in this mortal coil? Who am I kidding? We all know the answer to that. If only the Lions had an offense, they may have a win on this season. It's been a year of pain and this game seems to be adding to it. The defense has shown up. They're slowing down a Vikings unit on the road against all odds. Minnesota is playing the shittiest football I've seen from them all year. Cousins has been sluggish, they're without Dalvin Cook again, the offense is doing nothing against a defense devoid of anything resembling talent. Hard work and dedication is a hell of a drug. So does Minnesota doing Viking things like always. Missed field goals? Total Viking move. Clutch performances? How about a fumble on the 20-yard line? Oh my plump Jesus, the Lions are going to tie. They scored a touchdown to make Minnesota shit their pants. The ballsy motherfuckers, they're going for two! Ah. For the lead! The Lions have it! Detroit did it. They're going to single-handedly fire Mike Zimmer into a lake. Anger about as the Lions collapse on the final drive because they can't play defense and Adam Thielen finally did a thing to get them into field goal range. Joseph to give the Vikings the lead back. It's up there, it's out there, and it's How in the fuck do you lose on a game-winning field goal to the Vikings? It's like losing in a marathon to a quadriplegic. Why are you, you lions? Why must you waste everything handed to you on a silver platter? You made Dan Campbell cry. This is the most heart-wrenching thing I've seen all season. An 0-5 team finding incredible ways to lose every week. God really does hate the lions. Since he is doing their first initiation in becoming a man. In ancient Sparta, young men would hunt down and kill a slave as a test to ascend to be a Spartan. The Bengals honored this tradition by attacking a poverty franchise and killing them with witnesses. Uh, some witnesses. Detroit was Detroit, there's no argument there. Dan Campbell cried last week and it still could not will them to not suck. Not with Cincinnati trying to overcome last week's devastating loss by missed field goals. The talent they're showing, they have the potential to make some noise in December and January. I'd still prefer they get a better coach, but that's minor nitpicking. At Ford Field, everyone's a winner. Except for Detroit, they're irrelevant. Perhaps Jared Goff can show up and help out? Maybe the talent that's still there around him can? Anytime would be nice. Matthew Stafford being visited by the uncle that tormented him for years. Detroit forced him to rot away under terrible ownership and shitty coaching. And now he gets his chance at revenge. Little did he realize that the Lions had their own tricks up their sleeve. They can't compete with the Rams in an open field, so Dan Campbell must rely on guerrilla tactics to stay afloat in this game. Onside kicks in the first quarter, fake punts going for it endlessly on fourth down. There is no other way for them to win. And Campbell is a man that will do anything for his first as a coach. His team plays hard for him, there's no denying it, but that's all they have. Despite everything they've done, Detroit can't gain control, but is within striking distance. They're only down one score. All they need is for Jared Goff to do something against his former team. And now you see why they traded him. Jared Goff has now become Jared Goof. The Rams take the lead on the back of Stafford and Jared Goof... Well, he makes Dan Campbell cry again. The Rams win, Matthew Stafford gets his bittersweet revenge, and the Lions continue their quest to be the best winless team ever. Despite how shitty the year is on the surface, this is unironically the best season the Lions have had in years. Sad, but true. We thought the Detroit Lions had a chance of winning this game? With how hard they play and how shitty Philly is coached? I've learned a valuable lesson with this massacre. Never ever offer praise to an irrelevant franchise like the Lions again. I'll take that encouragement and go back to drooling on the floor and punching the drywall out of habit. In front of a sparsely attended Ford Field, the Eagles soared all game long. For 60 minutes, it was clear. 
Lions poached on the savannah and skinned for precious furs. That's the name of Detroit football for the past God knows how many years. If you didn't know any better, you'd have thought Philly was back in their Super Bowl prime today. The Lions continue their second march to winlessness with another careless loss. Even then, they can still be the best winless team in football history. Well done on the tank, lads. <laughs> Heinz Field. A place where magic has happened. Both in terms of fantastic victory and hilarious hijinks, this hallowed ground has brought us some of the most majestic football our eyes have seen. For a nondescript Sunday game, there is much on the line for the Pittsburgh Steelers. They've won incredibly ugly this season. With a combination of insane luck, weak opponents that have somehow stayed in games until the end, and bribing officials to gift them a win against Chicago, life is good. We all know the conclusion to this season. The Steelers are going to the Super Bowl. Do not deny it. Yinzer arrogance will consume you all, and you will enjoy every second of it. Especially as their opponent is... <laughs> Detroit Lions, one of the worst teams in terms of talent thrown out onto a field in recent memory. On the opposite side of the spectrum, they've had terrible fortune with their losses this year. Coming up short in a furious comeback against San Francisco. Losing on a literal kick of God from Justin Tucker. Falling apart on a final drive and losing by field goal to the Vikings. The Vikings. Detroit is so miserable that they probably ended up losing to the bye week by multiple scores. Good lord, this is a team that needs their first win badly. Dan Campbell is a likable folk hero, he of biting kneecaps, endless grit, and crying for his team during press conferences. Not that it matters, since destiny awaits. It's expected that the Steelers dominate on their way to... Why the hell are you fading to black? I was told the new guy would know how to cut video. Do us all a favor and put the game back up on the... No! No! Stop playing that goddamn music, I said I was done with that shit! There's no fucking drama surrounding this team. Playing it louder isn't going to do anything! Drama! Tonight, on Why Is This Still a Thing, the Black and Gold Brigade suffers an infection that takes out the heart of the team. This season, foolish or not, is for Big Ben. His weathered corpse will be carried to a Super Bowl come hell or high water. We all know that Ben doesn't like taking no for an answer. <coughs> Fortunately for him, Corona Chan also doesn't like hearing that word either. Roethlisberger will be out against Detroit due to COVID protocols. It's a loss for a team that's had trouble producing on the offensive side of the ball, even if he's nowhere near what he was in his prime, as the leader of many took it upon himself to self-report his own symptoms. A true American hero. Now Steeler Nation groans at the prospect of having to see Mason Rudolph, the two-pick quarterback, again. He's not much of a downgrade from what they have, but don't tell Steelers fans that. It's the thought that counts. Can I stop with the shitty voice yet? Please? Good. Starting the game, you know something's up. The opening snap is mishandled and somehow thrown for a completion. As I'm getting flashbacks to the wildcard game, Pittsburgh does what many somehow did not expect them to do without old man Ben under center. Score a touchdown. To all of our surprise, James Washington still exists. The joy and jubilation of Yinzers commences as they will be going to the Super Bowl. A glorious poaching of lions is expected on this miserable day near the Three Rivers. If only the game had stopped there. And I think everyone outside of sick fucks would agree with that statement. Every fan in attendance now wants not Captain Fat Fuck Dead for lobbing a pass right to the defender. He's at least better than Jared Goff, who decided to go back to 2016 for him and can't throw a football. He literally can. He's injured and limited in ability as a result. May God bless the greatest stealer to ever live, Presley Harvin. Absolute fucking unit. I wonder if he can play middle linebacker for Pittsburgh. Good in pursuit and open field tackling couldn't be much worse than some of their depth options. And maybe some of their starters. Detroit gashed the run defense for a long touchdown. In typical Lions fashion, Jamar Jefferson couldn't even celebrate this occasion. He got injured on the damn play. Tie game. But the black and gold brigade has a response. They push down the field again because Detroit is merely a mirage resembling a football team. And Najee Harris rumbles for a touchdown. Shit, holding on the offense. Who knew that going cheap on the offensive line would cost in other ways? The passing attack can't get them to the end zone and play calling gets conservative. A field goal gets them back to the lead. I would thank God himself, but the Detroit Lions offense is still bursting through the Steelers defense by means of the rushing attack. I will, however, thank God that the Lions don't have a real quarterback and can't seal the deal at the goal line. A computer-generated kicker nails a chip shot, and we're tied at 10 at half. The hapless Lions are getting the ball at half, but this shouldn't be a problem. All the defense has to do is... Uh, 
No comment. Apparently, no one on the bonded stealer deacon can tackle. The inevitable is here. You know it with five words that pierce my soul. Playing down to their competition. At this point, I've come to expect it. This has been a tradition of the Steelers going back to the days of Cower and Knoll. It's spread into Yinzer DNA. Why do you think most of us live here? Because we've accepted playing down to everything in life. But this is something special. A team without much in terms of talent is keeping pace with a supposed Super Bowl contender. This is more than no Ben. Lacking him means not using your first round running back at the goal line on three tries? The deficit is only three, but this game says a lot about both Detroit's resolve and the Steelers' flaws. People are running through walls for Dan Campbell, and this effort is showing it in spades. Welcome to football hell, where the standard of terrible play is the standard. Detroit is playing hard, but their fans will be miserable due to acquired perks in the early game. But we need one more spark to make this truly miserable. Oh God, TJ Watt? That's the last person the Steelers can afford to lose. Everyone in a 50 mile radius is now rightfully shitting themselves. Myself as well. You'd be knocked out of the game and will probably miss some time, but it's fortunately not the worst case scenario. Praise be our Lord and Savior, TJ Watt. Even then, it's a blow to this game and the defense in general. They at least have Najee Harris doing everything on offense to at least get them in field goal range to tie the game. I can only hope that the media isn't lying about Najee sleeping on floors again. But now we begin the true greatness. The football gods desire terror and anguish to be stricken on the football watching populace. Ref ball with a flop that would make Neymar cringe. Fourth down conversions by Detroit at their own 30 to punt on the next set of downs because they have no passing game. Oh mama, I've been fearing for my life from the long arm of terrible football. Overtime has put an end to my running and I need to throw it 50 times in this game because Steelers. No one is happy. Yinzers want Mason Rudolph dead for reasons of not being banned. Detroit just wants the pain to end. All that matters is that the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to the Super Bowl, baby! Look at Deontay Johnson! Go, you beautiful bastard, and run for God! Fucking Paris! Woman, you have lied to me! My kingdom for a man that can hold onto the ball longer than a loaf of bread. God. Intercepted! Yes, an interception, my Minka. We're free for uh, Defensive holding. Devin Bush, what the hell happened to you? Where's your game-changing ability? This has trashed your performance, man. You're better than this, boys. Come on! Oh, I forgot. Breathing on a quarterback these days is considered to be roughing the passer. This rule is fucking terrible and inconsistently enforced, but the NFL won't get rid of it because they'll pretend that it prevents concussions. So now Detroit's in field goal range. And all I ask is, how do they fuck this up? The kick. Look. I know Heinz Field is a terrible place to kick, but that kind of miss will get you cut from college teams. If this guy were a League of Legends player, he'd be bronze five. If Detroit is a kicker, this game is already over, but once again, the Lions can't have nice things because of Bobby Lane having an old grudge. I wish the Steelers could do something with these opportunities, but they can't because what's the point of snapping a ball properly? The spirit of Marquise Pouncey is in Kendrick Green today, and I couldn't be more proud of him. Here's a near interception because nobody has hands and Mason slightly overthrew the ball. Nobody deserves to win this shit fest. It's an on-field abortion. And I only hope Bain has rigged the field with explosives to put us all out of our misery. But if there's a pastime the Steelers love more than anything, it's being bailed out of their incompetence by talent. I can feel the hope swelling in me now. Mason is moving the ball effectively. They're almost in field goal range. Another incredibly ugly one on their way to the Super Bowl. Hey, a win's a win, right? I can hear the music now. Here I come to say the- No! No! Oh, of course they fumble there because everything is- Mother- ah! Detroit plays hard for their coach, but that's only one component to a winning team. There's also this pesky thing they need called players that can play at the professional level. Jerry Goff has been terrible, but he's injured. Lions fans meet Tim Boyle. He's been marinating under the tutelage of Aaron Rodgers for the past few seasons. After his performance in Cleveland, he needs to get back in the football oven. He still needs to cook, preferably for another 20 years. It wasn't like the Browns were even good. Baker Mayfield is visibly injured and he's turning into a liability with how it's injuring his performance. The Browns are out of sync, yet they're insanely lucky that they managed to face the worst team in football and come out of it alive. Hell, they can even one-up the Steelers by saying they didn't tie them. Dan Campbell's taken over play calling recently. 
And it's obvious he doesn't trust them to do anything as he's more conservative than a man stashing cash under his bed after the depression. The best part about this game was that it ended. May we never speak of this evil again. Force Washington to one tradition and change their name, yet we are still subjected to watching the Detroit Lions on Thanksgiving. Couldn't they have at least pushed this game to the 4 p.m. window so we could all pass out for a few hours after dinner? Like most disasters in Chicago, it's a mismatch of misinformation and confusion. Rumors were swirling about Matt Nagy's overdue firing as coach after this game. They tend to be taken with sincerity when they're told by a Pulitzer winning reporter. And it's exacerbated when people are chanting Fire Nagy not only at Bulls games, but at his son's high school football matchups. Chicago then returned to quietly stewing about how terribly run the Bears are as George McCaskey reiterated that they are accountants. And firing a coach in the middle of the year isn't financially efficient. You may have noticed I haven't mentioned anything about the game itself so far. Would you rather me lecture you about how pathetic it was? Are checkdowns on 3rd and 32 considered to be peak football? The only positive thing I'll say is that Dan Campbell has embraced the spirit of the tank. With how badly he botched the play calling and game plan, it's the kind of ineptitude we haven't seen out of a coach since Freddie Kitchens. Chicago's final obnoxiously long drive? Oh man, Salvador Dali is envious of seeing a clock this mangled. The Bears won out of spite for themselves. Detroit is miserable since they're still winless. Chicago is stuck with Matt Nagy as coach for another few weeks, and everyone who watched even a second of it feels like they wasted their time. No one won. Except for the NFL, because we'll willingly see this slop. Is everybody all that surprised that the Minnesota Vikings are having serious trouble trying to dispatch a team they should be crushing? If you are, you're the damn fool. This is what the Vikings do every year. This is what they've been doing for most of the goddamn season. It doesn't matter if the Detroit Lions have no fucking talent whatsoever, those bastards will jump off the Renaissance Center for their coach. Do you believe that Minnesota, despite being far superior in terms of ability, would do the same for Mike Zimmer? That dude would consider the playbook for Tech Mobile to be too revolutionary. It shows in how the Lions bounce on an unprepared opponent to gain an early lead. When a team capitalizes on countless mistakes to somehow bring about a convincing 14-point advantage at half, all is good. But then we realize the Lions are a glorified XFL team. And Minnesota does have talent on their offense to bamboozle whatever pieces are on what they call a defense. The Vikings should be far better than what they are, you know. It shows on how they quickly turn this back into a game to only be down by two. I would say tied, but they failed to succeed on the two-point conversion, but that's just a small inconvenience. Detroit's going to fuck this up. That's been their MO for a bunch of their losses this season. If Minnesota could stop shooting themselves in the taint, maybe they could realize it. But the Lions don't trust their defense. They're trying to go for it on fourth down at their 30. Right idea, but terrible play call, Dan. Play action on one developing routes? What the hell is that? Of course, Minnesota responds quickly and manages to score a touchdown with ease. But did they give them too much time? Regardless of how awful they are, the Lions have players fighting for new contracts. They're going to give everything they've got on the final drive. The Viking defense is weak and ripe for exposure. Even from a guy like Jared Goff, a potential miracle is happening. Despite every obstacle they throw in their own way, Detroit controls their own destiny to end the game. Do it, Lions. Do it for all of us. First victory of the year on the line. Goff's got it. Back, looks, throws, and yes! Caught! Touchdown, Detroit Lions! They did it! Armin Ross, they brought in the receiving end! They did it. They did it. Oh my god, it happened. For the first time in almost a year, the Detroit Lions have won a football game. Miracles abound in this time of glory. Rain pours in the Sahara. Cats and dogs are teaching each other advanced trigonometry. Both the communist and the capitalist are holding hands in matrimony for a great day is upon us all. The Lions have won. Dreams can come true. This is like John Scott in the NHL All-Star Game. They're terrible and shouldn't be anywhere near that situation, but you can't help but root for them. I don't even feel like laughing at the Vikings for how pathetic they are. They do enough of that shit on their own with Zimmer still being there. No. This day was about Detroit. And Oxford High School. This and the Michigan Wolverines win were for those kids. May those that died rest in peace. The gods have blessed the Broncos today. 
Out of tragedy comes a form that harkens back to a championship prize. Detroit, their roster limited by illness and their sluggish performance were merely a conduit for healing and recovery. Defensive suffocation. Offensive competence. A powerful dual threat rushing attack of Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams. It's another round of going up and down the roller coaster for the Broncos. This time, oddly enough, they may have life. They're seven and six and have a fighting chance for playoffs, but they face other January suitors. But none of that matters right now. This day is to pay tribute to a team legend that was taken from us way too soon. This day is about Demarius Thomas. This dominating win was for him. For one moment, there are bittersweet feelings for Bronco fans. Lions, I know you were the feel-good story last week, but this takes credence over your blasé trinkets. There's probably some room in the corner for you to gather dust. <laughs> Detroit's Lions eliminated. We can all agree this year has been insanely fucked for the NFL. Most games like the last one we recap feel like they're on some kind of drug cocktail. It's exhausting to follow this league some weeks. The only benefit is in memes fresh out of the oven. You thought it couldn't get worse. An old friend has re-emerged onto the scene. Corona Chan is back from her lengthy vacation and wreaking havoc on every sports league throughout America. The NFL has felt her wrath hard. You may have noticed all the coughing last week. It was for good reason. Over 150 cases in the league over a five-day span. It's not Pokemon to catch. Coronavirus is running a train throughout multiple organizations. Cleveland and the Rams have over 25 players in COVID protocol. Washington has over 20. Other teams like the Bears, Texans, and Lions are getting wrecked as well. Eight teams are in enhanced COVID protocols. This is the worst case scenario we were fearing last season, and we're seeing it happen in front of our eyes. The NFLPA pleaded with the league for games to be postponed, but of course they waited until the last moment. In a shocker, the Shield cared more about game integrity than cold hard cash. The Saturday Browns and Raiders tilt has been pushed to Monday. Seahawks versus Rams and Reskins versus Eagles have been rescheduled for Tuesday. We have it again in doubleheader form, boys. Tuesday night football. Any chance we can get a Wednesday night game? For all the glorious memes? This shouldn't be much of a recap. A championship contender is playing a dead team walking and we expect it to be a competitive match? I feel sorry for the poor bastards about to be annihilated on this hallowed turf. Light a candle for them tonight. Because they're going to be strewn by their entrails to the sounds of weeping women and children. Woe be to these poor men. For they will fall victims to swarms of cardinals and their loyal following. Go. Winds up! Touchdown, Detroit! Dude, what are you saying? The blowout was the other way? What the fuck? So you want me to believe that the Detroit Lions, fucking Detroit, beat the absolute shit out of Arizona? A team that's contending for the number one seed in the NFC? Who is this year's dealer? I want some of the drugs that the NFL is on. Real talk, this is a pretty impressive win for them. I get that the Lions fucked up their tank with this, but I think that winning here is much more important to them. They're showing improvement. Good work, boys. But really, how the hell did they make the Cardinals look like absolute shit? Atlanta has been riding on the edge all season. A year of begging to be put out of their misery simply will not end. Their anguish must endure for longer. Look at how enthusiastic Falcons fans are to see this torture for themselves. The team has no expectations whatsoever, but we all want to see the Lions win. The Falcons have had their chances to choke away repeatedly. The NFL desires new heroes who will inevitably fall short. Jared Goff is unfortunately out with COVID, so it'll have to be done with Aaron Rodgers' former water boy, Tim Boyle. The kind of games that are usually forgotten have a lot on the line for both teams. Job security, new contracts, and team pride. There's a reason why both teams are still giving everything they've got. It's an audition for next season. With this in mind, both teams are in a tight contest. Atlanta has a slim lead into the second half, but Detroit has always been keen on playing spoiler. A seven-point lead isn't too intimidating, but Atlanta stuffs them at the goal line and must settle for a field goal. But do you know what the Falcons do in these situations? It's a classic as old as time itself. Failure at infinitum. Atlanta is bowing to their old stereotypes of choking everything away. And all we need to do is watch the final chapter in action. Probably, as you said, end zone shots from the nine yard line. Reynolds or Amon Ross St. Brown. And it's intercepted! Oh, come on. Nobody wanted Atlanta to win. Not even Falcons fans. 
great, you're still a game behind for the right to have your asses kicked in the wildcard because Tim Boyle forced an awful pass into triple coverage. Who do you think you're playing against, man? Minnesota? Atlanta's not dead, but as I said, the anguish must linger on. It's a bittersweet moment for Seattle. This has the potential to be the last home game for both Russell Wilson and Pete Carroll. Nothing set in stone yet, but if this is truly it for both of them here, they went out in style. A flashback to the golden days of Russ's magic and booming legions. Of roaring crowds and a zeal that threatens those that dare enter this hallowed domain. Tim Boyle is forced to start for Detroit, but it wouldn't have mattered if Goff was healthy for this. Seattle's offense found a life they've been sorely lacking all season. Rashad Penny had the greatest game of his oft-injured career. And it may help him find a bigger payday in free agency. They made the Lions defense look as useless as it's usually been with such an undermanned unit. This one was meaningless in the grand scheme of things, but this might be some form of closure, an ending to the greatest era in this franchise's history. You just wish it could have been more, but that's getting into speculation. The Jets can be pissed off elsewhere. To be honest, the first overall pick doesn't matter for the Lions. There isn't a clear-cut top draft choice, and they'll get an elite edge rusher with the second pick if they desire one. Green Bay has nothing to play for, so Aaron Rodgers is going to be taken out of the game at halftime for Jordan Love. Don't tell that to Detroit, however. They're going to pull out every damn trick in the book for a win. Once again, it's not about the tank for them. It's about pride. It's about one-upping the older brother that has tormented them for decades. In odd fashion, the matchup has become an offensive shootout in the second half. Are we back to 2018, Jared Goff? Because he's returned to a surprisingly good form in this final match. In response, Jordan Love throws a long touchdown to Josiah DeGuara to give Green Bay the lead in the hopes of good tidings for the potential of life without Aaron Rodgers next season. However, Detroit will have the last laugh. Jared Goff will be the man that will lead the relentless fight. Jordan Love? He forces interceptions to give the Lions a sweet end cap to a rebuilding year. I've said it before and I'll say it again. This is the best season Detroit has had in years. And even though this win may be meaningless, it's huge for their morale. As a result, it doesn't matter if they win or lose, Jacksonville has successfully defended their tank ball title. Well done, lads. Kayvon Thibodeau, or whatever you want to do with the first pick, is once again yours. This has been a season. So many twists and turns that it's hard to conceive with the naked eye. If you were looking at this year seriously, it was absolutely exhausting. But do you know the true bounty to cherish? The memes. It was fucking gold for this economy. Thanks to incredible collapses, fantastic comebacks, Urban Meyer's coaching tenure, and whatever the fuck Antonio Brown did in the Jets game. I've said it before and I mean it completely unironically. This is the best season the Detroit Lions have had in years. When you look at the team on the surface, you'll think I'm crazy and it's understandable. Detroit has no talent, they're beginning roughly their 10th deep rebuild in 20 years and the Ford family still hasn't a clue to run a football team by osmosis. Even then, Dan Campbell has done things that the Lions haven't seen in a while. Coach a team that plays with heart. His players, while lacking ability, would run through walls for that man. There were endless obstacles thrown in their way. Endlessly painful defeats, injuries wrecking the defense. Jared Goff. It'd be enough for a team to unanimously win the Tank Bowl, but Detroit overcame it. They showed progression. And to be frank, that's all you can hope for in these kinds of years. If there's one suggestion I'd make, Dan, stop calling offensive plays. Anthony Lynn may have been terrible at it, but some of Dan's calls were very baffling. That's a minor nitpick, however. It will hopefully call a better future soon. One where Aiden Hutchinson is drafted and the city celebrates Matthew Stafford proving Detroit's a shit pile by winning a ring the first year he leaves. It's the greatest accomplishment the Lions have had this millennium, 